Welcome back to MVM. Today we're going to be taking a look at Pagan Fate of Roanoke from Wormgold. This is a two-player asymmetric game where one player is going to take on the role of a witch hiding out amongst the population of Roanoke, and another player is going to be playing the witch hunter trying to root them out. Before I get started, Wormgold has released a statement that I think is important here, just to state that this is a complete work of fiction. It is not meant to resemble or relate to any actual historical events or to condone any kind of violence or anything that may have happened in the past. Rather, this is a play on that fantasy trope of the witch hunter versus the witch. So with that being said, let's go forward and talk about the actual game. As I said, it is two players. One player is going to be taking on the role of the hunter, while the other player is going to be taking on the role of the witch. And you're going to have player boards that represent both of those characters. The characters are each going to start with a similar set of tokens, but they are going to work out differently in the game, and they're going to come in a variety of different amounts. Each character does come with an influence disc that's going to track your influence that you'll be able to build up and spend over the course of the game. Each character also has a number of action pawns. The Witch Hunter has three identical pawns in the shape of a hat, whereas the Witch actually has two different types. They have their Witch action pawns and their familiar. And this is actually important because you can hire different familiars over the course of the game. The Witch Hunter is going to have a number of evidence tokens and clues. Their goal is to spread out clues in order to discover this evidence. The witch, on the other hand, has secrets and favors. Their goal is to spread secrets across the board in order to turn those secrets in for favors. In addition, each player is going to have an asymmetric deck of cards that's going to represent all of the things they can do during the game. Now, there are four different types of cards, and they are a little different from the hunter to the witch. Both have event cards, basically, that can be played to interfere with the board or to do some kind of one-time effect. The hunter is also going to have investigation cards that will allow them to investigate the characters and they will have locations and allies that they can use to their benefit. The witch has those event cards called charms. They also have enchantments that can globally affect the village. They have brews that they can try to brew over the course of the game and they have familiars that they can summon to power up their familiar token. And you're going to place all of these things in front of you. Then you're going to set up the board. You're going to choose three each for the different colors of villagers. Three blue, three red, and three green. Now, for the version I have, I only have these nine, so it's going to be three of each. You're also going to build the suspect deck by drawing each card that represents each character and placing it in this deck and giving it a good shuffle. Now, this suspect deck is going to determine who the witch actually is. Remember, they're hiding out among the population of Roanoke, so they are one of these nine characters. The witch is going to draw the top card of this deck in secret, but I will show you for the purposes of this demonstration that the witch is Mayor Biggs, this character right here. Now, the witch is going to look at this card and place it face down in front of them, showing that they know who they are. The rest of these suspects are going to go back into a deck that the Witch Hunter can draw from. Every time the Witch Hunter draws one of these cards, they're ruling out a suspect because if the card is in the deck, it can't be in front of the Witch. So once all that setup is done, you're going to draw three cards from the top of your deck, and then you're going to be ready to start the game. So let's talk about the actual actions, which you're going to do by spending these action pawns and placing them out on different locations, either out here on the board, on your specific player board, or down here on your player aid that gives you some specific actions. Both players are going to have access to some shared actions, but both sides are also going to have specific actions that only they can access. But let's talk about the main action, and that is to visit a villager. If you're going to take one of your tokens and place it on a villager, a few things happen. First of all, you're going to activate that villager and you're going to gain their ability. Each villager has an ability down at the bottom. Once an ability has been activated, it cannot be used again. So if you place your token out, the other player cannot come and take that same action. So it might be better to block actions from your opponent even if they don't benefit you completely. The second thing you're going to get to do is place out a number of tokens on specific cards based on the number. You'll see here on native Pamvi, you're going to get to place one token on any red card. 
Now, for the Witch Hunter, all you're going to be able to do is place one token on any of these red characters, including the character that you visited. These represent clues. The Witch Hunter is investigating these characters over the course of the game. As you take these actions and you start to accumulate clues on characters, you'll get into a situation where you have three clues on one character. If you visit a character that has three clues, in addition to placing out more clues, and in addition to their ability, the Witch Hunter is also going to get a piece of evidence. And they're going to take one of their square tokens and place it in front of them. This evidence is important because it can be cashed in later to accuse the villagers. It's important to note that the witch probably doesn't want to let the hunter get three clues on a character. So they're going to do everything they can to avoid that. The witch is similar. If the witch comes and visits a character, they're also going to get the ability of that character. And they're going to get to place secrets. Now the witch has something a little different. I talked about those witches brews that they can sit in front of them. Whenever you can play a card, which some of these abilities out here are going to let you play a card, and there's actions on your player board that will let you play a card. Every card costs a certain number of influence, but once you pay that influence, you can play that card out in front of you. Now, the witch has brews. Every time you visit a character that lets you place tokens, you could place tokens on a brew that matches that color. So instead of placing my secrets out on a specific character, I can place my secrets back on my brew. As soon as a brew gets the required number of secrets, it triggers immediately and you get some kind of effect. So the witch has to decide, do I want to work on my brews or do I want to spread secrets to the characters? Because if the witch does spread their secrets out on the board and they visit a character that has three, they can actually cash these secrets in for a favor token. These work a little different than the Witch Hunter's evidence. The Witch wants to get these favorite tokens on characters so they can spend them to power some of their abilities. Now there's one other way that each player can interact with the villagers. The Witch can cast enchantments. Whenever they play a card, they can choose to play an enchantment here to the enchantment board. And you'll notice that these are going to cost more influence the more you get. And you can have up to three enchantments out at a time. This enchantment is going to give some kind of global effect that's going to either hurt the witch hunter or make it a little easier for the witch to interact with the characters out here. Now, the witch hunter has to take an action just to get rid of that enchantment and that's printed on their board. But in addition, the witch hunter can also raid villagers. They're going to get to pick a villager and spend three clues from other villagers that match that color, including themselves. For example, I can spend three blue clues here to remove a favor from a blue character. So that's one way that the witch hunter can stop the witch from getting favors. And of course, there's lots of ways that the witch can stop the hunter from getting those clues. So you're already seeing the asymmetry in the way that these two roles interact with the villagers. But that is going to be even greater when you look at their different player boards. Now, I already talked about the fact that the witch can add brews that they can complete over the game. The witch can also pay to play familiars to their player board. Whenever the witch places that familiar to take the familiar's action, they can boost the action by choosing one of their three potential familiars and using that ability as well. And there is a white ability here that you see that's the basic ability. And then there's a red empowered ability that the witch can pay for in order to make that effect even stronger. So the witch can play out a number of familiars and they can really power up that token and do a lot of different combo actions. Over on the hunter side, you're going to see a space for locations. You can play locations that can be visited as an action. For example, the armory is going to remove two secrets from villagers. You'll also have a number of spaces for allies. When you play allies to these spaces, they're just going to give you some kind of ability that's active through the rest of the game, but they may have an upkeep cost. This is a cost of influence that you have to spend every turn or else you'll have to discard that particular ally and not use them anymore. So you're going to be using all of these different methods. The goal for the hunter is to continue to collect these investigation tokens. And the goal of the witch is to continue to put favor tokens out on the board. The ultimate goal for the witch is to have three favor tokens on their hidden character. So for this demonstration, they want three favors to be on the mayor. But you have to be very careful about doing this because if the witch hunter starts to notice that you're placing a bunch of favors on one character turn after turn, 
they're probably going to suspect that that's your character. So you need to either throw them off the scent or just take your time and play out favors in a bunch of different directions to try to mislead the witch hunter. But if you do end up in a situation where you have three of your favors on a character, you can place your action token on that character, complete a ritual, and win the game. So that is the primary way that the witch can possibly win. Now for the witch hunter, they're trying to do something a little different. First of all, they're going to spend these investigation tokens. If you spend three investigation tokens, you can draw the top card of that suspect deck. This is going to tell you a character that the witch is not. And this is private information for you. The witch doesn't know what you know. So the fact that I know it's not Preacher Wolfric means that if the witch is trying to lead me that way, I can pretty much see through that ruse. And this is, again, hidden information. So both sides have some knowledge that the other side doesn't have that they're going to have to use to their advantage. But the ultimate way that the hunter is going to win is by eliminating the villager that they think is the witch. Now, if a witch hunter ever has three clues on one character and at least one clue on every other character on the board, meaning that they have at least tried to investigate every other character, they can choose to eliminate one. You just spend the three clue tokens that were on it and you discard that character. Its ability is gone. Any favors that were on it, any secrets that were on it are all spent and that card is discarded from the game. If the witch hunter managed to eliminate the witch in this way, then they win the game. They've taken out the witch. However, if they failed to get the witch, if that was just an innocent villager, it's a penalty against them. If they ever accidentally eliminate three innocent villagers, the game is over and the witch wins. So the witch hunter has to make sure that they know who the witch is before they just start eliminating. Now, there are some strategies mixed in here where you can eliminate characters based on their abilities, not wanting the witch to have access to some of their special abilities and things like that, but you need to be really careful because you're only gonna get three tries before the end of the game. And you're gonna go back and forth like this until one of the in-game conditions is met. Again, the witch has to get three favors on their hidden character and trigger the ritual, and the witch hunter has to eliminate the witch. Or they can accidentally eliminate three innocents and end the game that way. So this is Pagan Fate of Roanoke. The game is on Kickstarter, so take a look at the Kickstarter page to see what all the final components are going to look like. I know that this is a game still in progress. The rules are still in progress. The cards are still in progress. I don't know what all they're going to have in store for the Kickstarter campaign, but follow the page to find out. And as always, please like, subscribe, comment. Let us know what you're most excited about here at MVM, and I will see you next time. Hey everyone, if you guys enjoyed this video, please consider dinging the old bell below. That is going to help notify you of new videos that are uploaded to our channel. And as always, give us a like, subscribe to our channel, and please consider watching all of our videos, one of which you can see right here to my left.